Done. Um, we, are, we are carrying on with a series tonight called Legions. Uh, this is the fourth week in that. And really excited about that. The first week we started off, Howard spoke about the need for the fear of the Lord and wisdom when it comes to living under God's lordship, um, giving him our allegiance. Brad spoke about the, the war that is raging for our allegiance. And then Joe last week spoke about the weapons that God has given us in order to fight that battle. Tonight we're going to be looking at something called the nature of allegiance. And I'm going to unpack that just now, but we're going to pray together commit our time to the Lord, commit the Lord's word to our hearts, and then, and then get stuck in together. So Father, we just want to thank you that we get to be as your people in your presence. I want to thank you, God, that we get to read scripture, to hear your heart, and then to respond in obedience to you. And I pray, God, that that would happen tonight, that there'd be nothing that sets itself up against your people receiving truth, that sets itself up from your people being under you and resting in you. And so we pray for rest tonight, or we pray for peace tonight and authority in the Spirit for the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. So, um, like I said, tonight we're going to be looking at the nature of allegiance um, and basically the nature of living under lordship, which is our, which is our tag phrase. Um, the question I'd asked myself a couple of years ago was, what does it mean, by, well, what does it mean when we ask, what is the nature of something? Right, and um, really, the, like the definition of the, of the nature of something is the characteristics and behavior that make that thing what it is, right? So you can have, you can have two roller coasters, right? I've been on two roller coasters in my life, right? One is the Cobra and one is the Anaconda, all right? Um, one's in Cape Town, one's in, in Joburg in Gold Reef City, but essentially what you're saying, because I would often, like, I would ask somebody, like, what's it like, right? And essentially, that's what you're asking. You're asking, what's this thing like? What, what makes it what it is? And when somebody asks me about the two experiences I've had, I'd be like, well, the cobra is incredibly fast, right? It's yellow. It's short. It's not that long. It, it is, um, it's, it's jerky. It's not very smooth. It's absolutely terrifying, okay? Um, you also sit on these chairs where your feet dangle and that sort of stuff, and the ride to the top of the drop is also incredibly slow. Breathtakingly beautiful, but like really slow, right? Then speaking about the, co- uh, speaking about the anaconda, I'd go, well, it's a much longer ride, right? It's a lot smoother. It's a, it's a lot slower. Right? It's just, in my opinion, far more enjoyable. I got off there going, I can do that again, all right? So speaking about the nature of something really just describes what it is and the experience that you have when you are around this thing. That's, that's the nature of something. Similarly, you can have two animals, two dogs, two exactly the same breed, and one will have a different nature to this one because the characteristics that make this one up are different to this one. They're still two of the same thing, but completely different because their natures are different. So this evening, we're going to be looking at the nature of allegiance or living under the lordship of Jesus. And what's more, I feel like we're also going to touch on um, the cause and effects, or the effects of um, the nature of something. So we're going to look at the effects of the nature of living under allegiance. So if you're around someone who's a happy person and a joyful person, the effect on you is positive, right? If you're around someone whose nature is negative, the effect on you can generally be a, and is generally a negative effect. And I feel like there, there is an effect that um, we feel in our lives when we live under the lordship of Jesus. And so we're going to look at the nature of that and the effects in our lives. And we're going to be looking at um, two specific scriptures, and we're going to be referring to them tonight and going back and forward between them. And we pick two because they, they highlight different things, but also similar things. And um, context, just quickly before we go into the first passage, which is John 6. By the way, if you want to turn there, we're going to start in uh, verse 60. Jesus is busy teaching a whole bunch of people and uh, the, his disciples, not just the 12. The 12 are part of this group and he's, he's doing a whole bunch of teaching. And then he moves into a place where he moves and, and, he, and he teaches something really difficult for them to understand. It's not your average teaching. He says, if you want to inherit eternal life, you've got to drink my blood and eat my body. All right? And they're like, whoa, this is a little bit weird. Okay? And, and, and a lot of people are unhappy about this. And they ask for clarity, and he just reiterates it. He goes, you've got to drink my blood and eat my flesh. We know in hindsight what he's saying and what he was speaking about, but for them they didn't. It was really difficult for them 
to get their heads around it. So we start off, that's the context, and so we start off, and this is what it says in verse 60, on hearing it, this, this weird teaching from Jesus, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Right? Verse 66, from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Then Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's our one passage. The next passage is in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. One day, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come help the other boat to come help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. These guys would later become known as the sons of thunder. That's such a cool name, right? Um, then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up onto the shore and left everything to follow him. The two really amazing passages of Scripture which speaks to, us, speaks to us a lot about what it means to, to live under lordship and what the nature of allegiance to Jesus is really like. One of the first things that struck me, and it may not be that obvious, but the, the first thing about the nature of following Jesus is, is that it's an invitation. That it really struck me that this thing is not forced on us. To come into submission and to live under the lordship of Jesus is an invitation. God doesn't force us into that place. I believe that in my life and for every single one of us that, that know and love Jesus, there, there came a time and a, there, there was a point in your life, a defining moment, a fork in the road where you had to make the decision to follow Jesus or not. But that decision wasn't just made out of you know, a lack of knowledge or not knowing anything. That decision was made based on a revelation we received and I believe that that revelation is a God-given revelation that we couldn't have given to ourselves. Matthew 16, 13 to 17 says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So there's this place where Simon receives this, this revelation of who Jesus is. And it's not because a man has told him about it. It's because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to him. The Father has made the, the truth of Jesus known to him. And then he sits with this decision now. What do I do with this? And when it comes to living under the lordship of Jesus and giving, your, giving him your allegiance, you're never forced or coerced or like a robot programmed to just go, I believe we make a decision, but it comes from an understanding of Jesus is given to us by the Lord. That's almost the invitation. It's, this is who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit reveals this to us, and then we sit there going, do I want to come to the party, or don't I? I have, um, and I just feel like I need to say this, because some people's radars may have gone up when I said you have a choice to make. Right? Um, I believe that I'm completely at the mercy of God, and I believe in his sovereignty and hold in high regard the sovereignty of God. 
But I do believe that an overemphasis on the sovereignty of God or misplaced emphasis can lead us to feeling like or believing that God is hard, unapproachable, unloving, unreasonable, a dictator that just lords it over you. But what I've come to realize and what I've come to believe God wants us to really embrace about him is that he approaches us with love even though he is sovereign over all. Even though he's in control of everything, God comes to us and doesn't force allegiance on us or force us under his lordship. He comes to us and he approaches us with love and tenderness, compassion, kindness, and wisdom. I just I take the question that Jesus asks the 12 in our passage in John chapter 6. After, I mean, you can imagine how Jesus feels here. He brings their teaching, which is truth and life. And people hear it and they go, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Cheers. And they're gone. And then he turns to the 12 that he has a really tight relationship with. And he doesn't ask a rhetorical question. He doesn't ask a question and make a statement. He, he doesn't go, you don't want to leave too, do you? In other words, saying, I know you're not going to leave. He genuinely asks this question. You do not want to leave too, do you? And I believe Jesus in that moment makes himself vulnerable. It's a genuine question, and it's heartfelt. And the 12, I'm sure, are sitting there going, I, I, just, I hope I don't have to eat your body and drink your blood. I, just, I really hope I don't have to do that. But even if that is what you mean, we've had a revelation of who you are, and we're choosing to stay. We make this decision, and Peter's response is amazing. One of the most profound statements and answers anyone has ever given Jesus. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? In other words, I make my decision to stay. Only you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. He makes his decision based on revelation. The exciting thing to me about this, the effect of this, the cause, what it does in my life is it holds me accountable to my faith into my relationship with Jesus. Nobody can come and say to me, oh, shame, Roland. You, like you're a Christian, you were just forced into that. That's terrible. I go, no, no, no. God in his grace decided to reveal who he was to me. For some unknown reason, he chose to love me that way and he gave me the privilege of being able to say yes to him. And so when, when I'm not submitted to him, when I'm not uh, under his lordship, I want you to call that out of me because I chose to be there. God didn't force this on me. I love that I get to walk with Jesus. That's one of the characteristics. It's part of the nature of allegiance. It's not forced upon you. And it comes out of a revelation of who he is, which is my second point tonight. You're going to just unpack five, so don't worry, I don't have 15. My second point, the second characteristic of the nature of obedience is an acknowledgement and an acceptance of Christ's authority and lordship in your life. There has to be that. There has to be an understanding of who Jesus is because this is, this is how uh, you define allegiance. It is loyalty or commitment to a superior. That's what allegiance is. It's, it's loyalty or commitment to a superior. So in order to give allegiance to Jesus, you must know who he is because knowing who he is will reveal to you that he's far superior than what you are. And for me, that was the understatement of the year when I wrote that down, that Jesus is far superior than I am. Of course he is, but I need to know that, I need to accept that, I need to embrace that and understand that if I'm going to be able to be allegiant to him and submit to his lordship and live under his lordship. There has to be a revelation of who he is. For Simon Peter, there's this, there's this interesting journey of revelation that takes place in Luke 5. I love it because I can almost just imagine being there, right, and, and, and it being me. I want to read that again and just unpack and just point out his journey to you, uh, this, this understanding of who Jesus is. So it says, Jesus one day standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the people are crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So obviously he's a teacher of the word of the Lord. And he's teaching, and people are crowding around him, so there's some recognized authority already, and he's probably not too far off uh, from the boats, because it says he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So Jesus is probably teaching, and his people are around him, and these fishermen are washing their nets, they've just come in from a hard night's work, and they can overhear Jesus teaching. They recognize something's happening, they might have already recognized that he was a rabbi and a teacher, and um, they see that people are giving him uh, honor and respect by listening to what he has to say. 
He then goes over and he gets into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asks him to put out from shore. Now, already here, you, you can assume that Simon has a respect for the authority that Jesus carries because this man he doesn't know just gets into his boat. Right? Somebody you don't know just gets into your car. The chances of you letting them stay there without any invitation or understanding of who they are, without any like, like understood authority, is not very good. Right? So there's this understanding that he has. There's a choice there that Simon makes to let Jesus stay because he recognizes this authority. He then says to him, Man, just, I know I'm in your boat, but I want you to just put out a little bit more. And so, and so he listens. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down your nets. The reason why, but because you say so, is this, because he recognizes authority in Jesus. He recognizes Jesus carries some authority and it would be really disrespectful and it would look really bad if he didn't do what Jesus was asking him to do. But it gets better because he goes and he does it. They catch such a huge amount of fish that their nets began to break. So much so that they had to call another boat, their partner, to come and join them. Their nets get so full, their boat gets so full that both boats began to sink. And here's the Here's the beautiful moment. It says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. That's not go away from me. I don't like you. Go away from me because I've just got a revelation of who you are and I don't like me. Right? In light of who you are. He falls down and he goes, my Lord, capital L, I am a sinful man. For him, his, all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus says that the most beautiful thing, don't be afraid. And I think sometimes we are so scared to acknowledge and to submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus because we feel like we're going to be harmed by him. But we took the invitation and said yes to him out of a recognition of authority and um, lordship that he has and we need to be able to rest in that and trust that his heart is to see us experience and step into life. It's part of the nature of allegiance to Christ and living under lordship. It's acknowledging his authority and his lordship. The passage ends off with the fishermen having a revelation of Jesus and responding in obedience to the call of Jesus on their lives. They, they just they leave everything. It says... Um, Jesus says to them, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll become fishers of men or you'll fish for people. So they pulled their boats up onto the shore and left everything and followed him. This highlights the third characteristic of the nature of obedience. It's unconditional or absolute obedience to Jesus. This is how the internet defines obedience. A dutiful or submissive compliance to the commands of one in authority. So we accept the invitation that's not forced on us. We accept it because we recognize authority, but now we have a responsibility to be obedient because of the authority we say we've seen and we know Jesus has. So we move into that place where we now are obligated, not because we're forced, but because we've chosen to be there and to love Jesus because of who he is and who it's been revealed to us that he is, to now be obedient. I don't know who it was, but Ryan was speaking to me, and I wish I had found it. But there's someone who just said, I'm going to get the, wrong, the words wrong here, but it said, the, the level of our obedience is directly proportionate or directly proportional to the level of our revelation and understanding of who Jesus is. Right? So the, the revelation we have of Jesus determines how obedient we are to him. And you know, sometimes I look in my life, I'm like, wow, I've really squashed or lie to myself about who I know Jesus is, because if I look at my obedience levels, they're like negative numbers. God's got to remind me again, gently like he does, who he is, and cultivate that fear of the Lord in my life again, which is what Howard spoke about when he started off this series. We need the fear of the Lord to be allegiant, but getting sidetracked. The Bible says that we show our love for Jesus by obeying him in all things. 
John 14, 15 says this, if you love me, keep my commands. That's Jesus speaking. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I want to add in there, even if it is difficult or when we don't want to or when it is beyond our understanding, we don't have the right to pick and to choose what things we're going to be obedient to or not. That's not the nature of allegiance to Christ. It may be a type of allegiance that exists to something else, but not to Jesus. If you want to be allegiant to Christ and live under his lordship, you don't have an option to choose some commands and others not. It is absolute and total, and that is evidence of your love for him. Think about our two passages. First, John 6. Jesus brings a hard teaching. Do you know how many times people have turned away from Jesus and have left the church because something difficult has been preached from the word? And people are going, I can't accept that. That's just too difficult for me to apply to my life. It means I'm going to have to give up this, 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 this. Sorry. Gone. Or they quench the work of the Spirit in their lives and they sear their consciences by denying that this applies to them and that the grace of God is just going to cover it. So I can walk in disobedience over and over and over, and I'll just, I'll just pretend it's going to be okay. Jesus brings a hard teaching, and many leave, but the 12 stay because they recognize authority, and they recognize truth, and they recognize that what Jesus has brings life and not death. See, the enemy would have us believe that the commands of Jesus are there to suppress us and to squash us and to push us down and to box us in. The reality is aligning yourself with the lie of the enemy does that and stepping into the commands and obedience of Jesus, obedience to Jesus brings freedom. It brings true life. Jesus says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come so that you may have life and life abundantly. That's what Jesus says. Then Luke 5, can you just imagine how hard it was for these fishermen to hear Jesus say, I want you to put out into deep water and put down your nets for a catch. You you get a taste, a little bit of their frustration when they're like, Master, we've worked hard all night. I'm not really sure if you're a fisherman or not, but we've been out on the sea the whole night. We've labored hard the whole night. What you don't hear them saying here is, we want to get home. We're tired. We're wet. We're cold. We stink like the bait we bought, but no fish. Right? We're hungry because we have no fish. This is not something we want to do. This is a difficult teaching. Right? This is a difficult request that you are making of me and of us to go back out. But because you say so, we will do it. It's beyond my ability to rationalize. It's beyond my ability to want to do because I'm human and I'm weak. But I acknowledge your authority and so I'm going to do it. And I'll go. And I'll do it for the glory of his name. And it ends up blessing them, which is one of the effects of obedience to Jesus is blessing. And an abundance of blessing. And I'm not talking health, wealth, and prosperity preaching here. Although, I believe we are blessed in the physical sometimes when we are obedient to Jesus. But a lot of it has got to do with what we gain spiritually and when it comes to intimacy with him. These guys, their boats start to sink. They've got so much fish. But what's interesting is they don't take that with them. They leave everything behind. They may have brought a few with them to eat along the way, right? Some sushi for on the go. But it says they left everything everything behind. So other people were blessed as well by their obedience. The other boat and the people on the shore because there are a whole bunch of people. I'm sure they saw this happening. There's two boatloads full of fish. I'm sure people help themselves. Right? Obedience leads to blessing. And I obey because of the authority I recognize. And so Jesus, I believe, can rightly ask this question to Christians who don't obey his commands. He says, why do you call me in Luke 6, 46? Why do you say to me or call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? 
James Pace, one of our interns, often says, it's an oxymoron. And often there's an oxymoron. You say, Lord, Lord, but don't obey. It's like, it just doesn't match up. And Jesus is saying, don't say to me, Lord, Lord, and then not do what I say. If I'm your Lord, you acknowledge your authority. If you acknowledge your authority, you, you do what I ask you to do. The enemy, just, just want to say this, the enemy hates it when we're obedient to our king. He hates obedience to Jesus because obedience leads to blessing, strength, and life. Just, just after that passage, that, or that scripture that I just read in Luke 6, Jesus goes on, why do, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not go and do what I say? And he says, I'll tell you what it looks like for someone to be wise. They take my words, and they put them into practice, and it's like a house that's built on a rock. When the waves and the storm come, the house stands firm. But if you hear my words, and you don't put them into practice, you're like a foolish person who builds a fancy house on the sand, and when the storm and the waves come, the, way, the house just crashes. When you build your life on the commands of Jesus and the authority of Jesus and you obey him, you are protected. You are safe. Your life is secure. Spiritually, you have an inheritance that will never fade away. Maybe here yeah, life is tough, but you're protected by God. You're walking, even sometimes maybe physically in a dangerous place. You're in the safest place you could possibly be because you're in the center of God's will. The scripture, Psalm 91, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. When we apply God's word to our lives and we live in obedience, we're like a house built on a solid rock. There's life, there's protection, there's something firm there. The fourth, the fourth characteristic of allegiance to Jesus, and this is one for me that is absolutely crucial, is a love of truth. It's a love of truth. Psalm 119, verse 151, says this. Yet, O Lord, you are near, and all your commandments are true. There's no ways you're going to love the commands of the Lord and live a life of obedience to him if you don't love truth, because his commands are truth. The Psalms are full of the psalmist's praise and declaration of how much he loves the word of the Lord and God's commands and precepts and law. So to live under Christ's lordship, we need to love and not just love, but align ourselves with truth. And we've got to love it. But we've got to love and align ourselves with more than just the concept and the substance of truth. We've got to align ourselves with the person of truth. Truth as a person. See, Jesus doesn't just go and get truth off of a shelf somewhere. He is truth. That is his nature. It flows out of him. He says what is true and what is not. He doesn't subscribe to some moral code. He is the moral code. John 1.14 says this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Jesus comes full of grace and truth. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. In other words, if you don't love truth, you do not love Jesus. It's not possible for you to love Jesus. If you don't love truth, it's impossible for you to love his commands and to be allegiant to him and to live under his lordship. It's not possible for you to do that because you hate the very nature of the one you profess to follow if you do not love truth. Just before our passage um, in John chapter 6, Jesus is doing some more teaching. You can go and look it up. I'm not going to read it. But three times he, he teaches something different. And each time he starts to teach, he says, I tell you the truth. And he teaches. I tell you the truth. And he teaches. I tell you the truth. And he teaches. Three times he says it. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Again, what this is saying is if you hate truth or don't embrace truth or think truth is subjective, you're never going to love or embrace the teachings of Jesus and his word to you, or you're going to think that his teachings are subjective. I can just interpret them how I want to, apply them to my life how I want to. Jesus says, no. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What I tell you is truth. You embrace and love truth, absolute truth as it comes from me. 
your allegiance to me. And you can live under my lordship. That's the nature of living under his lordship. Jesus speaks nothing but the truth. And we've got to love that. If you weren't with us um, three weeks ago, um, I mentioned that Brad preached a sermon on the battle that is actually going on in the spiritual realm for our allegiance. Paul writes and he says, um, I, think it's to the, I think it's to the Ephesian guys, he says, um, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. He says that to them. Right? And Brad was speaking about that. And one of the things that Brad highlighted was that the enemy attacks our allegiance by trying to sell us a lie, like he did to, to Adam and Eve in the garden. He tries to sell us a lie, and it's one of his you know, methods and schemes to rob us of living under the lordship of Jesus. Because if we, can, if, we, if we buy it, and if we accept it, and if we align ourselves with the lie, we step into sin. Because at the root of all sin is a lie, the belief in a lie. And then that places us in bondage. And there's condemnation, and there's guilt, and there's shame, and it's just a perpetual cycle that just goes on and on and on until we come to a place where we realize the lie that we've believed and then repent of that and step into truth. Jesus says in John 8, 31 to 32, he says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. A characteristic of living under the lordship of Jesus and being allegiant to him is freedom. It's one of the things that we gain is freedom from bondage. This also highlights the thing that Joe preached on last week. Joe then followed on from Brad. He spoke about the battle for our allegiance. Joe spoke about the, the tools or the weapons that God has given us with which to fight the battle. And one of the things she said was that the word of God is a weapon. Ephesians also speaks about that. Paul goes on to say, you know, the word is like a sword. One of those weapons, the word, we need to use diligently. God's word says that his word is truth and his truth sanctifies us. If we don't love truth, we don't love the word, we don't love the weapon that we've been given in order to fight the battle for our allegiance, it's not possible to live under that. We have to love truth. I want to just make one more point and highlight why the love of truth is such an important aspect and part of the nature of allegiance to Christ. For me, it's one of the most significant points I'm going to make on this. Um, If you haven't already got how important the love of truth is, let me just finish this point with this. I want us to look at John chapter 6 together again. Um, Peter makes this declaration when Jesus asks him, do you not want to leave as well? He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, you have what we need to hear and you have truth, right? We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God and I don't want to be anywhere else. This is where I want to be. Now, parallel that with the scripture in Luke 4, 31 to 35. Speaking about Jesus, it says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out, the man possessed, the demon in him, cried out on the top of his voice, at the top of his voice, Go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? You have come to destroy us. Have you come to destroy us? The demon then says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And then Jesus says, be quiet, sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down on the floor, threw the man down before them all, and came out without injuring the man. It might seem a little bit weird to hold those two together when it comes to understanding the love of truth, but let me explain what's happening here. In both of those stories, Peter's confession and declaration and the demons, there's an acknowledgement of the authority of Jesus and a declaration of who Jesus is. Peter says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. The demon says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Right? In both of our stories, 
as a result of the realization of who he is, there's obedience. Right? Both the fishermen and the twelve. They stay with Jesus and they walk with Jesus. And you know what happens with them if you read the rest of the New Testament. And with the demon, Jesus says, get out of him, and the demon obeys. So there's an acknowledgement of the authority. There's an, an acknowledgement and a knowledge of who Jesus is and a declaration of who Jesus is. And there's obedience. The only difference is the attitude and the response as a result of being in the presence of truth himself. That's the only difference. The one response embraces and loves truth, the other hates it. The demon sees Jesus and he goes, before he even declares who he is, he says, go away. Get away from me. What are you doing here? Have you come to destroy me? I, I, I cannot be here. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. So the one is hating truth. And when the declaration about Jesus comes, the response is, I want to get as far away from this as possible. I want to get away from this. The other response is, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And I want to stay here. And I want to make my camp here. And I want to follow you because I want this. I want to submit myself to this. I want to align myself with this. This is beautiful. It is doing something in my life that I can't get rid of and I don't want to shake off. Do you see the difference? There's a love of truth and a love of who Jesus is and a love of what he brings. An acknowledgement of authority and obedience to that and a love of the truth. It's the one thing, a love of the truth. It's the one thing that distinguishes between our allegiance to Christ and the demonic submission to him. The last thing that I'm going to say tonight, that's my last point, is part of the nature of allegiance to Christ and living under lordship is absolute surrender. Total surrender to him. I think we have such a negative view of surrender in our culture because we watch movies where it's okay to fight until the bitter end and never surrender. Braveheart, Gladiator, Lord of the Rings. You watch those movies. A movie called Warrior and all those things. It's like never give up, never surrender, never be defeated. And I think there's a place where that's okay. I think there's a place where it's okay. But when it comes to Jesus, it's not okay to not surrender. I think the enemy would have you believe that to surrender is weak and you're admitting defeat and you've lost something. And often in battle, when we surrender, that is what happens. You're admitting weakness, you're admitting defeat, and you often get caught up and shackled and taken into prison as a POW, prison of war. So we're taught never to give up. But surrender, when we're speaking about surrender as a characteristic of the nature of allegiance to Jesus, it always means freedom. It always means freedom. It's an attitude and a posture that says, Jesus, I trust you. And you can have the keys to every door in my heart and in my life. Because I know who you are. I'm obedient to your commands. And I trust them. See, a lack of surrender, you may have that in your life. You may know who Jesus is. You may do everything he says for you to do. But there's still this apprehension. Can I really trust what he's asking me to do? Can I really trust? Can I really rest? It's, it's an attitude and a posture that says nothing's off limits. And I'm not going to fight you because I know that you're the one fighting for me. And that brings freedom and intimacy and rest and joy and abundance in the presence of God when we surrender. Surrender means that you can rest and enjoy the authority of Jesus because you know that he's not going to give you over to death, but has come so that you may have life and life abundantly. That's the nature of obedience. It's an invitation. It's a choice. It's an acknowledgement of who Jesus is and then a response to him in obedience, absolute obedience. It's a love of the truth and a surrender to Jesus because you know that everything he has for you is good. That's what it means to be allegiant to Jesus. That's what it means to live under his lordship. 
I don't know about you, but I, like, I want that more and more for my life. I'm going to ask the, ask the worship team to come up. I really feel like we need, to, we need to press in and pray into some spaces this evening. John, if you feel like there's anything as well that you want to bring, then just, just stop me if there's anything on your heart. But I really feel like we need to press in and pray into what it means to be allegiant to Jesus and ask God to cause us to love the nature of allegiance. So I'm asking the team to pray, play, and then I'm going to just pray into some things. And, and if you're in this space where you just need to surrender something to God, you need to, there's one, maybe there's one key you're holding on to, and you're not, you're not quite trusting him with that, or if there's a misunderstanding of truth, you're not quite sure what truth is or who Jesus is, that we're going to pray into that. Maybe you haven't even accepted the invitation that Jesus has put before you, and you wanting to, or you wanting a revelation of who he is, we're going to, we're going to press into that. All right, but um, I'm just going to lead us in prayer and then just speak specific things and ask you to flow with me or follow with me if that is where you are at um, in your heart. Then pray it in your heart, and I'd love to chat with you afterwards, and we'll have opportunity up at the front to pray and to minister to you. I hope that's, that's what God's been saying to you tonight. So, Lord, I just, yeah, for those in this place tonight who haven't even accepted the invitation, but know that they're faced with the decision now as to what to do with Jesus and the revelation that they've had of him, I pray, God, that you would lead them into life. And if that's you this evening, I just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would give me a greater revelation of who you are. That you would give me peace and boldness to choose you. And if you're someone who feels like you're in that place and you can pray this prayer further, then pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I choose you. I choose to give my life to you. I choose to be allegiant to you and to come under your lordship. Forgive me for my sin. I accept what you did for me on the cross. And I want to journey with you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to chat with you afterwards. Maybe you're also in this place where we just keep our eyes closed and our heads down. I'll tell you when we're done. Maybe in this place you're just going, yes, I've really struggled with authority. I've had bad influences, bad authoritative influences in my life. People have lorded it over me, abused their authority, hurt me, and I have a skewed mind perspective of authority. I love Jesus and I know who he is. But this idea of submitting to his authority just, it hurts me. I just want to lead you in a prayer if you're willing to go there. That's what I'd like you to pray. Lord Jesus, I know that you are the Holy One of God and you carry authority above and beyond all. I know that you love me, but I've resisted your authority because I'm afraid of past hurts and so tonight I bring that to you and I confess that to you I ask for your forgiveness and I accept the truth that your authority is freeing and that you love me and I choose now tonight to step into that authority and live under it because that is for my good and that is for your glory for those tonight who are struggling with obedience, there's, this, there's something about what God's asking you to do, whether it's something in the past, whether it's something ongoing, whether it's just a general fear of what He might ask you to do, pray this, if you're willing. Lord Jesus, I know that what you ask me to do may not always be easy in the physical, but you have eternity in mind. 
and I choose to focus on that. I choose to focus on who you are and to align myself with the truth that your commands are truth and life. So forgive me for where I've been disobedient. I repent of that in my life and ask now for the courage and boldness through the Spirit of God to work within me to step into obedience all the time. Father, I just want to pray generally for your people that there'd be a love of truth, an understanding of what and who truth is. And God, that we would become people who have a holy discontent for where the world and the enemy tries to suppress what is true and tries to disfigure the image of Jesus by bringing in deception and untruth. We rebuke the evil one, Lord, and his work in our lives. And I pray that we would have a greater revelation of truth and that there'd be a greater love of truth cultivated in our lives. For those of you who are struggling with this issue of surrender, and I've been there, it's been surrendering. For me, it's been a surrendering of stuff that's happened in the past and confessing it. I haven't surrendered to God because I feel like he's telling me to confess it is going to lead to me being judged and hurt. And so I've kept some doors closed. It was the most freeing thing to give that key over to Jesus and have him unlock that door. Lord, I pray for anyone who's in this place and you can pray this with me if this is you and if you're willing. If you're struggling with surrendering, every key of your life over to Jesus. Just pray this with me. Father, I'm, I'm really finding it tough to surrender because that makes me feel vulnerable. I'm really finding it tough to surrender because I've been hurt by surrendering to people in my life before. But tonight I want to put an end to that and repent of where I haven't trusted you. Because I know that you're the Holy One of God here to bring life to me. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness for where I've mistrusted you and I've kept back a bunch of keys to the doors in my heart and in my life. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I, I choose, Lord Jesus, to step in obedience and to surrender everything to you. May your spirit come and flood the caverns of my heart that have been locked up and fill them to overflowing, I pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, I trust you and surrender to you. Father, where your people have prayed those prayers, I thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that it is done, that there is freedom that there is life because of our allegiance to Jesus and our blessing of living under his lordship, your lordship. And I pray that as you move into a space of worship now, where we get to declare how great you are, may we as your people respond as an overflow to your goodness. May we respond as an overflow of joy because of the truth that we have in our lives. God, may nothing hold us back from bringing you the honor and glory you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.